Okay guys, so just a reminder, the reason this is at this angle and it looks so funky, my camera that I was borrowing from my friend died. It doesn't work. I don't know why. It won't work. But anywho, today it is book review Friday and I am talking about Full Metal Alchemist Volumes 4 through 6. Now if you have not seen my last video about this, Volumes 1 through 3, you need to see that. Also, you need to have read Volumes 1 through 6 in order to watch this because it's spoilery, okay? I'm going to break this down. Now for those of you who haven't and you're kind of like, but I don't know if I should, this is my favorite manga series of all time. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Edward Elric, the main character who is not on these covers. There he is as a kid. That's little Edward. He is my favorite character of all time. Five out of five stars, the whole series across the board. I've read this one chapter at a time. I never had a single chapter let me down. So I loved it. All right, so if you have not read it, goodbye. I will see you in another video. Okay, 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 bye. All right, again, this series is very character driven. That continues. And in fact, the characters continue to grow. We get a little more background about some of the main characters, Edward, not so much Mustang, his is much later, but Hawkeye, Edward and Al, Winry, that continues. If you want to see my character breakdown, you got to see my last video, Volumes 1 through 3. So let's talk about Volume 4. Where it starts off, they are still in Laboratory 5. Edward has been pinned down by Lust and Envy. Very quickly, they kill number 48. That's always ripped my heart out. It's That's hard to read. I always flinch when they kill them. Edward's arm breaks down, so he's knocked unconscious and they decide to just blow up the lab. Al, however, is being messed with number 66, aka Barry the Chopper. That is a big plot point. It's over half this volume is dealing with Alphonse going through this identity crisis that Barry puts him in. I always thought it was lame that Al really bought into, maybe you're just fake and Edward created you and you're not actually his brother. It always found it irksome and annoying, but at the same time, it's important for Alphonse character development. Again, he's very sweet, he's very kind, he's very gullible. And this is when he learns to not take things at face value. It's important for the character, but kind of annoying to read. It's one of the most annoying plot points in the entire series, if not the most annoying. Then we also get to meet Kimberly. There he is. He be cray cray. Oh my gosh, I hate Kimberly. Ha ha. That, that's my reaction to Kimberly. Is ha. And we get our first look to see just how twisted this man is. Another moment is when Edward gets slapped. He wakes up, he's in the hospital, and then Second Lieutenant Maria Ross and Sergeant Denny Brosh, Maria slaps Ed. And they yell at him. And I like it because we finally get to actually see these characters. I didn't mention them in Volume 3, even though they were there, because they were just kind of floating around. They were just the annoying bodyguards that Ed had because, again, of Scar's attack on him. This point and onwards, we really get to see inside their heads, especially Lieutenant Ross. Then Winry comes and she fixes Ed's arm and she goes to Central, but the real important plot point is one, it's the, she is the big catalyst of how Al gets over his identity crisis, but also we finally get to see Hughes's family. We get to meet his wife and his little girl because it's his little girl's birthday and she just turned four years old and it's so adorable and that's really important because this is the saddest volume in the series. I'll get to that in a second. We also get to see Hughes and Mustang's friendship and their dynamic. I really, really love that the military gossip is Hughes. The person who goes on and on and on about their kids and their personal life that no one cares about is Hughes. It's a guy. I love that. I thought that was so brilliant because, you know, usually when they have a character like that, it is a woman and usually a middle-aged woman or an older woman. No, 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 no. It's a middle-aged dude. Okay? It's a, well, actually, he's not even that old. He's like in his late 20s, early 30s. I always thought that was hilarious. Then Ed and Al fixes Al's breakdown. And we actually learn that Edward has not forgiven himself at all for what happened. I wrote in a live tweet, I'll link my live tweet down in the doobly-doo, the thought of the fact that Edward, as this little child, crying himself to sleep every night during therapy over the thought that his brother hates him because of what he's done and all this horrible guilt that he feels 
that just like almost brings me to tears. It's just so heartbreaking. Then Fuhrer King Bradley makes an appearance. We've kind of heard about him. He's kind of been in the background, but he makes an appearance while Edward is talking with Major Armstrong and of course, Lieutenant Colonel Hughes. And he's explaining everything that happened with Lieutenant Ross and Sergeant Bradley. And the Fuhrer shows up and he warns them basically not to look into this. You're kind of like, why would a Fuhrer just pop up? Why would the president of a country pop up to be like, yes, I know the military is corrupt. Don't trust anyone. And basically warns them off of looking into it too much. It's kind of like, hmm, some nice foreshadowing there. Then Edward plans to leave and <laughs> we get to the saddest part of this series. <sighs> my heart, oh, my heart hurts. Hughes is looking through Ed's findings and he discovers something. We don't know what, but he's looking and looking and he puts it together and goes, oh my gosh, I have to alert the military and there's lust. And she attempts to kill him and he attempts to kill her. And that's when we learn, homunculi oh, can't die. You can shoot them, you can stab them. They have a lot of lives and they can just heal themselves and keep going. Lust injures Hughes and then... <laughs> He is trying to contact Mustang, realizes that these guys are following him. The military phones have probably been tapped, and so he goes to a payphone. Can't get a hold of Mustang immediately because it's military calling into a base. He has to do, there's protocol that he has to go through. And then there's Lieutenant Ross behind him, except she is missing something. A mole under her left eye. He alerts said person, and it's Envy. And Envy adds the mole, because again, he changes shape, as I mentioned in the last video. And then Envy becomes Hughes's wife. That image was enough to make him hesitate, and Envy shoots him right when Mustang picks up the phone. He goes, what do you want, Hughes? Gunshot. And the visuals of this, the visuals, the last picture, look at this page. I don't know if you can see it. This is my cell phone. I'm sorry. Look at that page. His body and the blood next, the blood pooling around his picture of his family while Mustang screaming, Hughes, Hughes, Hughes. He can't get a hold of anyone. And in the anime, you learn that Envy reached in and hung up the phone. The pacing makes this. It makes this. We cut to Edward on the train with Alphonse. They're heading down south. They're heading to meet with their master and stuff as they talked about. They're hungry. So Winry pulls out this pie. Mrs. Hughes made this for us and she taught me how to do it. Oh my gosh. And they start talking about how they can't wait to see Hughes again and see his family and stuff because his little girl just turned four the day before. And then it cuts to Hughes' funeral. The funeral! Oh my goodness, the funeral! <laughs> so we see them getting ready to bury the body, and as they're everything's said and done, and they're burying the body, and it's very silent, Hugh's little girl Alicia starts screaming. She's like, why are you burying Papa? He's got work! Don't bury Papa! He's got lots of stuff to do! Everyone starts crying! Oh my gosh! Oh! Mm. And the last page of that... Papa, and it shows Mustang standing in front of the grave, his best friend's grave. He talks to him. Hawkeye comes over after he's finished talking to Hughes. He goes, oh, it's starting to rain. And she's like, what? No, it isn't. She looks up and she looks over and Mustang puts on his hat and tears are streaming down his face and says, yes, this is rain. I can't read that. Like, I could talk about it a bit without actually crying, but I cannot read that. No matter what, I can't watch it. I can't read it without bawling like a baby. Mustang goes through a crap ton more after this and a lot of stuff goes down. It's the only time in the series that he actually breaks down crying. Ooh, the rain part! Ugh, I even wrote in my notes a frowny face. Ugh. Then Mustang starts asking questions to figure out what's going on and I love the moment when he's talking to Hawkeye and just letting her know, he's like, I know you know that I wanna become fewer, but I'm just warning you now. I'm going after them. I just got promoted to Central. I am taking them down and finding out what happened to Hughes and who killed him. And he asks, let me pull, open it up. Will you help me? And she says, you know, there's no need to ask. 
Then we cut to Scar having a dream of a mixture of memories and nightmares and stuff, and we learn he knew Kimberly before Kimberly was in jail. It's like, hmm, no wonder Scar has issues. And so it ends with him being in an Ishbalan camp. Now, at the very end of the book, there is a bonus story called Dog of the Military? Question mark, And it's just this cute story about this little puppy named Black Hayate and how Fury found him. And he's going around Mustang's team asking for people who want to take the dog. Braid is terrified of dogs. We also learn that Al has this obsession with cats. And so he literally runs away with this poor cat stuck in his armor. Hawkeye is like, fine, I'll take him. So that's where it ends. It ends on a happier note after this really dark, sad, sad volume. Saddest volume in the entire series. And now I need to go do laundry, so I'm gonna come right back. Volume five starts much happier. It starts with them arriving in Rush Valley. Now, Winry had asked in volume four to go to Rush Valley because Ed and Al wanna meet their master, but that is in Dublin. And that's to the south. Literally one train stop before Dublin is Rush Valley, which is an auto mail paradise, basically. So Winry is going nuts and is so excited and stuff. And Ed's just kind of like, eh. And just as he fears, people are so excited about Winry's auto mail that they strip Ed down literally to his boxers to take a look at his auto mail right arm and auto mail left leg. When he is getting dressed again, he realizes somebody stole his pocket watch. Now, again, I don't know whether it's white gold or sterling silver, because it changes per volume. Such an issue with translation, dear sweet goodness. It is the mark that he is a state alchemist, so he needs that. A black girl named Panina stole it. There's this hilarious chase while he's chasing her all over the city, and she can is so acrobatic and do these amazing things. And Edward, of course, is using just alchemy to get everywhere, plus his martial arts and slash acrobatic type skills to jump on rooftops and stuff. Turns out her legs are auto mail. So Winry takes a look at the auto mail after Edward's caught her, but she still has his watch. Winry refuses to let Panina give the watch back unless Panina takes all three of them to her auto mail mechanic named Dominic. Once there, we get to learn about Panina's backstory and it is so powerful. During my hashtag a year thumb when I marathon this and of course during my live tweet of it, I talked about this before, but I'm gonna read it again. Panina lost her legs when she was a young child, like four or five in a train accident. She was very poor, so she couldn't afford any sort of prosthetics, whether it was regular or auto meal. And I think she lost her family. She ended up eventually crawling around on her hands and her leg stumps on the streets because eventually her wheelchair broke. She talked about how she didn't want to live. Dominic found her starving on the streets and just kidnapped this little girl and without her consent really, gave her auto male prosthetics for both of her legs for free. There's this point that really has always struck out to me and it's on page 64 of the volumes. Chapter 18. When I was finally able to stand on my own two feet, I felt so happy. The sun was warm and seemed so much closer than it had ever been before. These legs gave me back my will to live. They gave me the freedom to go places in life. They gave me a future. That's why I love Dominic so much, but I also love Rydal, Winry, and anyone else who works with auto mail. And so it turns out she's been stealing to pay back Dominic because he won't accept payment from her because she's extremely poor. She was again starving on the streets when he found her. And so you know he, she couldn't pay for it. They convinced Panina to stop stealing and to live a normal life um, using her auto mail to their best abilities instead of just stealing stuff. And then Dominic starts taking her payments. But it always has made me realize that the ability to walk is a blessing. Not everyone has it. Some people are born without limbs. Some people are born without limbs that move. Some people, whether it's just an accident or something ha malicious happened, they lose limbs. And the ability to walk is a gift. I'm getting tear choked up thinking about it because when I read this the first time, I did get tears in my eyes because it's just so powerful. Panina's story is so powerful. I'd never seen something like this explained this way before and Fullman Alchemist did it 
perfectly. Because, you know, Edward doesn't talk about that, how what it was like to lose his limbs. He never discusses it. So after that, there is an emergency and Winry has to deliver a baby. He gets to learn her backstory. Winry's parents were doctors who were killed during a war because they went to the war zone to help the wounded. Yeah. Ed talks about how he grew up, if he wanted to read anything as a child, he was reading alchemist texts because his father was a great alchemist. Whereas Winry grew up reading medical texts. That's why she is able to deliver this baby without any doctors present on her own. And when the doctor arrives, he's like, you did it perfectly. Just before the woman went into labor, Winry managed to open up Edward's watch, which he had not, still hadn't given back. And inside it said the words, don't forget, October 3rd, 11, which means the 11th year of Fuhrer King Bradley's reign. After the baby's born, she asks Edward about it. And Edward gets really mad. She's like, I opened up your watch and he's carrying her. And he literally just drops her on the floor and turns around and he does yell. But the only thing he yells is, you opened it? And she goes, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And she's like really sad and depressed because she knows what that means. And it's the day that Edward burned his house down. Again, Edward hasn't forgiven himself. And he actually says, I've never shown it to Al. I've never shown it to anyone because I feel kind of pathetic that I keep this around with me because I don't want to forget why we're doing what we're doing. And he doesn't want to forget the role he played. Again, reiterating, Edward has not forgiven himself at all for it. Winry gets an apprentice and the boys head to Dublith and we get to meet Edward's lovely master. And this is our introduction to her. She kicks Edward in the face. <laughs> Her name is Izumi Curtis. This is what she actually looks like right here. And she is a master alchemist and she trained Edward and Alphonse. There's some little discussion about things and then it turns out Izumi attempted human transmutation and knows that the boys did too. So she demands to know what happened. And we have a flashback that starts in this volume and goes all the way to volume six. Starts things out, Ed and Al are just living their lives. Their dad is non-existent basically, but their mother raised them. And they got bored one day and decided to look into alchemy. And they basically taught themselves with their father's notes. And then their mother gets a plague that's going around. They don't say what plague, but it I think in the first anime they mentioned she was sick for a long time and had never mentioned it and just collapsed one day and was dead within a week. And Edward and Alphonse are suddenly orphans. They live with Pinako. Ed and Alphonse see Izumi do some amazing alchemy during this flood of the little river that goes through it flooded during a big storm. They demand that they become her apprentices. She takes them on and says there will be a trial period of one month. They go down to Dublin, they go out onto this lake and there's this little island on the lake. And she says, you're going to live here for one month. If you manage to survive and don't die or something, you can become my apprentices. Okay, bye, and then leaves. So she hires this guy to watch out for them by, this is insane, this is so insane by beating them on a regular basis to teach them survival skills and martial arts and that she steals their food. But his main purpose you learn isn't actually that. It's to make sure that they're okay. So there is a point, I think it's now we're in volume six here. There's a point where they get very, very, very ill and they almost die. And so the man in the mask doesn't attack them. He nurses them back to health and feeds them and stuff. <laughs> make sure that they're okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's his main job, but he also is there to teach them martial arts and to make sure they don't use alchemy because that's one of the rules. It's insane. There's a point, I can't recall which one it is in, where her husband is in volume five. They run a butcher shop. They're running the shop and he's like, are you sure about this, honey? And she's like, oh, don't worry, they'll be fine. After all, I was left out in the middle of Mount Briggs, which is to the far north. <laughs> Mount Briggs for like a month. They're okay. The island's full of food and fruits and animals that they can kill to eat and stuff. They'll be fine. And her husband's like, don't compare yourself to normal people. <laughs> she's so weird and psycho. I just love her to pieces, but she's pretty darn crazy. She gave them a riddle. All is one, one is all. What does that mean? I am the one and all is the world. And that's what the boys figured out through their near-death experience. Through this, we really get to learn the basis of alchemy and how it works and why human transmutation is taboo. 
even though they learned it after they mastered it within six months they were ready she said and so she dismissed them and they went back home and they attempted the human transmutation very quickly after they activate the circle because they do the circle and they put whatever they're going to transmute in it and they put all the components to a human's body they use their blood as the soul component which doesn't really work and attempted it then it turns wrong the colors change and it's what's called a rebound. What that means is the alchemy is going to go back onto the alchemist doing it. In volume one, Father Cornello was trying to transmute a machine gun and bullets and stuff, and instead it fused with his arm and twisted, and Edward said, oh my gosh, it rebounded. That's how he knew it wasn't the actual Philosopher's Stone. Well, it rebounded. Alphonse was taken completely, and so was Ed, and they went through, they call it the gate, I seem to recall it's called the doors of transmutation. Every person has this. And every time they use alchemy, those doors actually activate. And once there, Edward meets something that doesn't have a name and gives it multiple names. He goes, who are you? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'm what you call the world or the universe or God or truth or all or one. And I'm you. And it's called the truth. They say, you've seen the truth. Edward when he met with his master before the background she goes you've seen the truth and Edward goes yes so have you through that edward gains the ability to transmute without a transmutation circle he just claps his hands together and he can transmute and so he becomes his body becomes the circle you only gain that ability and the knowledge of how to do that if you've been through the doors edward gains a lot of knowledge and then his left leg is ripped from him and he comes back and realize al didn't come back with his new knowledge he knows he can bind his soul to a suit of armor but he'll have to go back through and he offers up his right arm we cut to mustang and hawkeye it was a nice little bit of levity in a very serious backstory there's then the mistake mustang thinks he's going to talk to some 30 year old dudes no he's gonna talk to little kids Edward is 11 and Alphonse is 10. They arrive at Edward's house. However, Ed Mustang still wants to talk to them to talk about maybe a future in the military or something. Finds the circle with all the blood, lots of blood stains all over the house, demands to know where the Elrics are, and so he meets them. And then he talks to them. Now we get a little peek into Hawkeye because while Mustang is talking to Edward, Alphonse, and P Granny Pinaco, who's taking care of them, Winry is left with Riza outside and they discuss why she's a soldier while Mustang is discussing why to become a soldier. She says, because there's someone I need to protect, then it cuts to Mustang. Hmm, I wonder who she's talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, hinting that the two of them should be together, but they can't be because it's against military protocol. After that, we have this moment after they leave where Hawkeye is talking to Mustang on their way back. This is on page 116. She goes, do you think those boys will come? They'll come. You're very confident. Judging by the look in that boy's eyes, I'd say it was beyond hope. You think so? I saw eyes that were burning like fire. The idea of being a state alchemist is why Edward decided to try to live. He didn't have a will to live after this, and that really gave him a will to live. It gave Alphonse a will to keep going. And that is why he's doing what he's doing in the whole series. He gets the auto mail, goes through rehab that can take usually three years. He did it in a year, burned his house down, and became a state alchemist. When he shows up to meet, at the time he was lieutenant colonel, right then Mustang had just been promoted to colonel. Mustang asked him, are you sure you want to do this? Bow wow! Want me to wag my tail? I love him. Edward goes through the testing, tested personally by the fewer. Uh, he almost fails because he shows that that wasn't a very smart idea. Someone could attempt to kill Computer King Bradley. But Bradley's like, hmm, I'll take that into consideration. But he managed to save his own life because Bradley's very, very tough. And then Edward is named the Full Metal Alchemist, the nickname everyone has. Mustang's the Flame Alchemist. He is the Full Metal. We see them burn their house down and begin their journey, and then it cuts back. Now, if you've seen the first anime, their master beat them when she learned everything. That is not true. In fact, that goes against the character of Izumi Curtis. She states that she thinks of them as her own children because 
she attempted human transmutation on a baby that died during childbirth and the baby actually became stuck in the uterus. It is an actual problem that can happen and it's very, very dangerous and usually leads to an emergency C-section. They'll usually give you an emergency C-section if they think there's a chance the baby can be stuck because if the baby is stuck in the middle of trying to leave the uterus and come into the world, the baby can die and then it can kill the mother. The baby died, they had to actually pull her entire uterus out and she can no longer have children. So she attempted human transmutation and they took some of her insides. So quite often you see her, the whole series, she like barfs blood if she goes a little too strict. And that's because part of her insides and intestines are missing. That was what she paid when she went through the doors. She gets pretty angry and they expect her to hurt them, but that's not Izumi Curtis. Instead, she holds them and it's very clear that if Alphonse could cry, he would cry and Edward is crying. So powerful. Then she dismisses them for being their students. And it's just kind of like, wait, what? But that actually opens the door and now they can get her help no longer as students talking to a, a teacher, which is a strict technically type of relationships. And now they can discuss things as equals. And so she agrees to help them. Then we cut to Mustang who has been promoted to Central just as he said he would be and we meet a character named Lieutenant General Grumman. This is Mustang Superior or was Mustang Superior. Grumman through some very casual banter makes it quite clear that if Mustang ever needs anything he can ask Grumman and he asks for his entire team again that is Breda, Fallman, Fury, Havoc, Hawkeye. That's his five team members and they transfer to Central with him. And it's actually really funny because Havoc goes, oh, almost forgot, there's one problem, sir. What? You see, I just got a new girlfriend. Dump her, you can find a new one in Central. So Havoc's just like, ah. And the very last scene is there's this guy who doesn't look entirely human who asks Edward and Alphonse as they're traveling on the streets of Dublin if they're the one who transmuted a soul to armor. They are like, wait, what? The fight breaks out, the guy gets away and reports to a man named Greed with the Norboros tattoo on his left hand. And that's the end. That's it. That's everything. So we have lots and lots of questions still. We have to know why did the Fuhrer himself talk to them? Is he involved in with what happened to Hughes? We found another homunculus named Greed. Now we finally know Edward and Alphonse's backstory. We met his teacher and that she's also done human transmutation. I love the series again. Every volume itself, it always seems so short and yet it's just packed with information. All right, thank you guys so much for watching this. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. I am so sorry about the quality, but this is how it's gonna look for right now. Good luck with your reading and with your manga reading, and I hope you decide to give this series a try. Bye! All right, so if you have not seen it, goodbye! Or have not seen it, so half of this volume there's like a bug in here, so I don't know if it's on me or something. I don't know, there's a bug earlier. So, th so this is a long, bleh, especially, it's usually the tip, sorry, this watch is like sticking to me. And so, oh, sorry, I have my cat hair in my hand, eyelashes, my cats are shedding. With Maria and, uh, with, I keep calling her Maria, with Ross and Bradley, that's the thing, right? No, Ross. Auto mail, no, Nina. Sorry, I thought my thing turned off. I forget. It beeps at me if it turns off, unlike the other camera. Not my cell phone, not the camera. Ever. But then Izumi Curtis. Did I see the No. Bobby pin. Again, there was a bug in here, so I don't know if that landed on me. Nope, my Bobby pin. Bobby pin moved to her. Um, she actually says, well, let me go to this. I'm just jumping ahead. Is this still recording? Let me make sure. It is. Okay, thumbnail. Real quick. Real quick. I have no idea where the ankle is. <laughs>